Hi, my name is Mary Keorg, and today I'm answering some questions about refugee claims. Question number one. If the political or economic situation in my home country isn't good or I can't find a job, can I file a refugee claim in Canada? That's a good question. We get that question a lot. I would say that it really depends on the unique circumstances of your situation. Um, if, for example, it's just a political crisis, um, groups in the news are arguing, political parties are um, arguing about elections and things like that, this does not usually qualify for a refugee claim. Um, you need to have a direct personal risk to your life, meaning, for example, civil wars, um, civil unrest, uh, it could be a very unique situation of discrimination, but consistent discrimination that amounts to persecution. It could be, for example, a um, woman who's been in an abusive relationship and wherever she goes in that country, um, in the city, she's being followed, she's being threatened. So it can't just be the country's poor, the economy is bad, there's corruption, I don't feel good here, my kids don't have access to good education or good health care. There really needs to be a systemic, uh, continuous, direct problem to your life, to your safety, security. And we also have to demonstrate that the government cannot help you. In addition to that, we have to demonstrate that there's nobody, nowhere else in the country where you can um, hide or, or not hide, but live safely. It's called, in immigration law, it's called an internal flight alternative. So you need to have these three things in order to think about making a refugee claim. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people that end up coming in Canada and thinking that they're going to qualify because the situation in their country is not the best, but this is incorrect. Uh, so it's very important that you speak to a legal representative that has experience in this before deciding to uproot your life and the life of your family and your children and come to Canada. Because it's one thing to make a claim, but then it's something else to actually get an approval. Question number two. Can I submit my refugee claim while I'm outside of Canada? So the answer is no, although I would say it's a nuanced uh, answer because there are programs where you can actually make an application. Um, for example, there's overseas refugee applications that the government has specifically for certain countries. Um, for example, there's a group of two to five sponsorship and sometimes Canada will have specific programs with international organizations such as the United Nations or the uh, International Organization for Migration. Uh, for example, what happened with Syria, what, what's happening in the Ukraine, what happened in Afghanistan, where they're, they're able to um, target groups and bring them here and, and they come here uh, and they get landed as permanent residents. There's also charitable organizations and non-governmental organizations that have certain quotas and programs to be able to bring in uh, quote-unquote refugees. Um, but even in those programs, you have to meet certain requirements. So for example, you always have to be outside of the country uh, where you are persecuted. Uh, you have to not have another citizenship, another country where you can go and live safely. So there's requirements. So in that sense, yes, you can apply from outside, but it has to be a specific program. If you do not meet those requirements for all other uh, claims, you have to be physically in Canada. That means that you have to have entered Canada, usually either a visitor visa or through a temporary permit. Sometimes people show up at the border, often they show up at the at the US-Canada border, um, and you have to be physically in Canada in order to make that claim. So in our office, for example, we get a lot of emails from people that are in different countries and they say, you know, I want to come and make a refugee claim, uh, but they're in the country of persecution and, and we can't help them with that. It's very hard to advise because the only way we can help as a law firm uh, is if you are physically uh, in Canada. Question three. Do I need to hire a lawyer to help me file my refugee claim? You don't need to hire a lawyer, but I highly recommend it. Um, 
You can also hire an immigration consultant, but I would recommend that you do your research properly to make sure that it's somebody that has experience, that has good knowledge of refugee law, and that really cares about um, you and your application. Uh, a lot of people do file their claims by themselves and you're allowed to represent yourself in front of the Refugee Protection Division. Um, the process is, in theory, they should be simple for everybody to be able to represent themselves. A lot of refugee claimants that do come here don't have a lot of money. They, they spend all their funds on um, being able to buy a plane ticket and secure uh, housing, um, just everyday expenses for, for their family here. So it's it's hard to hire a legal representative. But if you do have the means and you you know, you know you plan a budget for that, I really recommend to hire a legal representative that has expertise and knowledge because it's a complicated area. Um, the forms look simple when you look at it, but in fact, everything that you're writing has is going to have a huge impact on your actual refugee claim when you go to the Refugee Protection Division for your hearing. So there's a lot of paperwork to fill out, complex paperwork. Then you have to submit evidence uh, for your claim. That has to be really well thought out. It has to be researched. Everything matters. You'll get correspondences from the Refugee Protection Division. Sometimes there's very difficult questions. And then you have to actually prepare for your case and you have to attend your hearing, you have to testify. Often there's going to be an interpreter. So there's a lot of things that come into play. Uh, so if you are able to hire a representative, I would highly recommend it. Question four. What social services or benefits are available to me once I file my refugee claim? So once you file your refugee claim, you're going to be currently the system is to file it on an online portal. Once it's being processed, there's going to be a, a first interview and then a second interview. Um, during After those interviews, either the first one or the second one, depending, this, the, the programs tend to change, uh, you will be able to have an open work permit and you'll also be able to have access to social assistance from the government if you need to. So the government will look at whether you're working or not, whether you have did you come to Canada with money, with money, no money, how many uh, members in your in your family? Uh, you'll also have a document called interim health um, benefits. So you'll be able to have access to some healthcare, if not most healthcare services. Uh, it doesn't kick in right away. A lot of people think that they come to Canada, they submit the claim and they'll get all this like the, the next day. This actually takes many months. I would say about two to three to four months, depending on backlogs, processing time. Sometimes we don't hear back for a long time. So it's important to have travel health insurance, to have money in case you need to go to hospital. If you don't have insurance, to have just funds to just pay your daily expenses. So there's a lot of information out there to come to Canada, make a claim, you'll get this, you'll get that. Yes, the government will be able to, to help you but it's not something that happens simultaneously when you enter Canada. So it's important to, to come prepared. What kind of documents do I need to include in my refugee claim? That's a good question. Um, so when you initially, what we do in the office is when we file the initial claim, we put just the mandatory documentation. So identity, uh, civil status documentation. And then we have an entire preparation around what we call disclosure. So disclosure is the documents to support your claim. So for example, if you are running away from a country where there's war, you need to prove that there's war. Some Yes, sometimes in the news articles, international reports, it's obvious, but it is your job as the claimant, the responsibility is on you to demonstrate to the board member that this is happening in your country. Um, if you are making a claim because you are in a same-sex relationship and you were facing discrimination because of that, you need to demonstrate that through documentation. Now, sometimes it's hard to have the documents, especially for certain types of cases. Maybe the situation was in public, you didn't keep any records. There are specific guidelines at the Refugee Protection Division to process all that. But what we tell clients is, let's talk, let's sit down, let's see what can you, what, what do you have to prove your situation? So examples could be, medical reports if you had injuries, doctor's letters for injuries or mental health conditions. If um, somebody destroyed your house, it could be photos, it could be police reports if, if you had to file a report. 
it could be chat records if for example you were in an abusive relationship and you have chat records of your partner sending abusive messages so it could be everything and anything specific to your case so that's something that at the office we really have to think outside the box because sometimes how do you prove a situation it's not always possible to have the document so we really prepare a personalized list and then based on our conversations we see what you can prepare and if you don't have documents, then we really have to focus on your testimony during the hearing. What happens if my claim is refused? If your refugee claim is refused, um, you, can, you have a right to file an appeal at the Refugee Appeal Division, the RAD. I believe the notice is within 15 days and then the record within 30 days. Those deadlines, sometimes they change, so it's important to make sure that you have the right timelines. It's not an autom It doesn't mean you're going to automatically file an appeal. Like It really depends if there was an error of law or, or fact and the decision, um, the decision maker really made an error. So it's, you know, legal representative will look at um, the case law, the documents submitted, the decision, what did the board member say, and does, should this be appealed? Um, if you do not, if it's recommended that you do not file an appeal, then unfortunately what's going to happen is that eventually CBSA will be contacting you to start enforcement proceedings. That can take a few weeks, it could take a few months. Uh, if you have minor children in Canada, you can file for a permanent resident application on humanitarian and compassionate grounds if we feel that you have a certain level of establishment in Canada. Uh, so that's another option. Um, if you file an appeal and that's refused, you have an option to go to the federal court. But again, the decision has to be unreasonable. Um, so there's different avenues and options, but it really depends on on what happened. Um, in some cases, some clients decide to leave. Obviously, if if you are refused, um, you won't have access. You know, eventually you won't be able to work. You won't have uh, certain benefits. So some, some clients decide to leave and depending on your unique circumstances, other clients decide to, to try other avenues. Okay. And Once my refugee claim is approved, do I become a permanent resident right away? No, you don't become a permanent resident uh, right away. That's a good question because a lot of people think that once it's approved, they're a permanent resident. Some people even think they become citizens, but it really doesn't work that way. So you get a document, a decision from the RPD, the Refugee Protection Division, saying that you are recognized as a, as a convention refugee and now you can apply for permanent residence. Now that, pro that part, the second part, can take up to two years most of the time it takes two years, sometimes even longer, because IRCC, Immigration Canada, has to do background checks, security checks, uh, a number of other uh, checks to get you landed as a permanent resident. During that part, you have to stay in Canada uh, most of the time. You don't have your passport. And it's, it's quite frustrating because some people want to travel, go on vacation in different countries, but they're not able to. Um, obviously you cannot go back to the country where you fled from. A lot of people also think that they can just go back to where, uh, the, the country that they, they, they made a claim against. And that's uh, very pro problematic, um, because when you do come back, um, you can be in, there can be an investigation. So it's important to know that once you have your decision, there's still a lot of work to do in order to get your permanent resident application. There's forms to be completed and it could take a long time. Uh, so you have to, you know, if you have plans for your children, travel plans or, um, you know, figuring out what your life is going to be, you need to understand that it's these things take currently at the way the system is, it takes a very long time. Now, can you walk us through what a refugee claim hearing looks like? Yes. So. Right now, most of the hearings are virtual. They used to be, in the past, they used to be all in person. Some of them are, are, are in person now, but most of them are virtual. The process remains the same. 
Um, basically, there's a board member. A lot of people refer them as, as judges, but um, the correct term is a board member. It's the person who is working at the Refugee Pro Protection Division who will make a decision on your claim. Uh, you will have you, the claimant, um, and your representative. It could be a member of a community. It could be an immigration consultant. It could be an immigration lawyer. Uh, you can have an interpreter who is provided by the Refugee Protection Division. And in some cases, not all cases, you can have the minister's counsel who represents immigration, who may decide to be present if there are certain issues at stake. But usually the minister's counsel is not there. And you can have observers like law students or anybody from the um, public with authorization because refugee claims are... Um, they're private, but in some cases, if requested beforehand, um, outside, a third party may be granted access to observe. Um, it The length of time depends of, of each case, but I would say typically it could be anywhere from one hour to three hours or four hours, and sometimes it can be over two days or three days, but it wouldn't be back to back. Usually it's, it's scheduled, usually weeks later or months later. Most cases I would say, um, uh, are in one sitting. Uh, the board member will always, everything is recorded and the board member will give instructions about how the proceedings will, will go, um, ask the claimant to be, if, if they swear to say the truth, they will give instructions to the interpreter, they will go through the disclosure documentation. So this is why it's important to have a representative because things can go very fast and it can be very confusing, especially if you're very nervous, if, if you've gone through a lot of trauma, um, your story is very difficult to share and you're there and there's very official proceedings and there's a board member, it could be very scary. So it's important to have somebody there uh, that's representing you and guiding you. Then what will happen is the board member will start asking questions. It could be a few questions, it could be a lot of questions about your claim, your story, why you're afraid to go back, specific questions about your documentation, about your identity, um, about whether or not you tried to get the assistance of the government, whether there's anywhere else you can hide. It could be about everything and anything, so that's why the preparation is really important. Uh, what I always tell clients is to always speak from the heart, speak the truth. If you, know, if, you don't under if you don't understand something, say, I'm sorry, I don't know, or I don't remember. I always tell clients not to guess, not to lie. These are all coaching things. Um, that we we explain to clients, which are really which can go a really long way in a hearing. Um, once the board member asks all the questions, the representative has an opportunity to ask questions too. So, uh, as a lawyer, I tend to ask a lot of questions if I feel that the board member didn't grasp kind of the important parts of the story. I try to clarify things, and um, and then at the end, the board member will allow the representative to make uh, oral submissions about why the claim should be granted or not. If there's no representative, then the claimant can do this, but this is where it gets complicated because there's a lot of um, legal argumentation involved here. Um, following the oral submissions, in most cases, I would say board members will reserve their decisions to later on. Um, they'll say, you know, you'll get the decision in the mail or through the portal in 30 days or 60 days. Um, some rare cases they will approve on the spot and they will give a positive decision which is really great when that happens because the claimant can kind of rest a little bit knowing that it's over and it's approved um, but it really depends on the board member each case is different so this is more or less the the the, the procedure of a refugee hearing and last question can i ever go back to my home country after I become a permanent resident? Yeah, so we talked a little bit about this earlier. Um, you, the, the answer is you can, you can always book a flight and go back, um, but you're not, you're not supposed to do that. So I find that a lot of people don't know this. So for example, people come here from Syria, make a refugee claim, come here from the Ukraine, from Afghanistan, or let's say from China, they made a claim, they got approved uh, and then once they get their passports back, they're like, all right, I'm going to go back, see my friends, see my family. And and then when they come back at the border, CBSA finds out, then you will, you can lose your uh, protected person status. 
you will have another hearing at the RPD called a cessation hearing. Uh, and if you're not able to demonstrate um, certain things, you will lose that status. Because if, the, if Canada is giving you the status, it's because you are afraid to go back to your country. Um, so if you go back, this means that you have reavailed yourself of the protection of that country. Um, there are some rare exceptions where you wouldn't lose your status, but it's a very difficult and complex area of law. And what I tell my clients is if you're making a refugee claim against your home country, you're basically never going back there again and you're, you shouldn't go back and you have to be really comfortable with that. Um, a lot of people don't know this and they don't get caught, but a lot of people I'm seeing more and more people being um, caught. So um, it's important to respect the rules and regulations and the policies. If you're making a claim against your country is because you are absolutely scared and your life is at risk. So you cannot go back to that country.